ought to be thankful every morning your eyes open and you awake uh, to a new day. The first thing out of your mouth ought to be thank you, Lord. Amen. And uh, even on your darkest day, even on your, even on the uh, the worst day of your life, you still, as a child of God, if you've been born again, if you're saved by the good grace of God, you still got something. Uh, to lift up your voice, raise your hand, and to point toward heaven and say, "Thank you, Lord." I tell you what, I tell you what, do the church of today a lot of good if we just get a fresh glimpse of what we deserved and where we ought to be. Amen. We all ought to be in hell with the back broke tonight. But look at us here in a good Bible believing church tonight hearing the good song sung and, and just the goodness of the Lord tonight and what a blessing that is and I tell you uh, it do us some good to get a fresh glimpse of just uh, uh, what we deserve versus what we're getting I tell you what it do it'll help us to be more thankful that's for sure and I appreciate the Lord tonight all right I want you to take your Bibles be found in the book of Psalms tonight Psalm chapter number 51 Psalm chapter number 51 and I give you the thought the Lord has laid upon my heart Psalm chapter number 51 and when you find your place, if you're willing to enable, I'm going to ask you to stand. And we'll honor the reading of that of the Word of God tonight as it is our custom around here. Psalm chapter number 51. Psalm chapter number 51. A very familiar text in the Word of God. And, uh, but one I feel led. Uh, this is where the Lord directed me for this evening. Psalm chapter number 51. Find verse number 1. Psalm chapter number 51 and verse number one, if you're there and you're with me this evening and you love your Bible, would you let it know my saying, amen. amen. The Bible says, have mercy upon me, O God, according to thy loving kindness, according unto the multitude of thy tender mercies, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from mine iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. David says, For I acknowledge my transgressions, and my sin is ever before me. Amen. Against thee and thee only have I sinned, and done this evil in thy sight, that thou mightest be justified when thou speakest, and be clear when thou judgest. Behold, I was shapen in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. Behold, thou desirest truth in the inward parts, and in the hidden part, Thou shalt make me to know wisdom. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Make me to hear joy and gladness, that the bones which thou hast broken may rejoice. Hide thy face from my sins, and blot out all mine iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit, within me. How many will testify tonight? You can you can have right doctrine in the wrong spirit. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. Heard a message preached one time, said the right message with the wrong spirit. <laughs> Amen. You preach a good message in the right in the right message, but doing the wrong spirit do more damage than you would if you'd just been quiet. Amen. He says, I want a right spirit. Renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from thy presence. And take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Verse number 12, we'll stop our reading here. The Bible says, Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation, and uphold me with thy free spirit. Heavenly Father, we love you tonight. Lord, thank you for the good singing. Lord, I thank you for the wonderful time we had together this morning. But Lord, that one... Uh, is in the history books, and tonight's a new night. And so I pray, God, we, we, may we uh, remove anything that's going to try to hinder or distract us from what you're desiring to do in that of the hearts of your people tonight. Lord, I, I pray, God, as we come to the preaching time, Lord, I pray you make preaching easy in here tonight. I pray for good liberty. God, I pray for an unction from above. Uh, Lord, give me a fresh touch and a fresh anointing. I recognize that I stand uh, where no man ever dare stands by himself. And uh, we recognize there'll be no preaching except you do the preaching, Lord. And so I pray, uh, may you breathe on us one more time. Lord, I pray that there, uh, there would be a, a great uh, uh, 
uh, move of God in this place tonight. Lord, I pray that uh, that no stone would be left unturned. Lord, I pray you prick every heart in the building. And for that one that may have walked among us tonight, and Lord, there's uh, uh, the truth be told, there's something uh, that's hindering their walk with thee. Lord, I pray they don't lead the same way they came. But God, I pray they get right tonight. Uh, Lord, if there's one here that's lost, I pray that they'd, uh, they'd get saved for it's everlasting too late. Lord, uh, do a work that only thou can do. I pray you make much of the Lord Jesus and may uh, his name be highly exalted in this place tonight and will not fail to give you all the praise, glory, and the honor for it all. For it's in Jesus' high and holy name we do humbly pray and all of God's people said, amen, amen, and amen. Thank you so much for standing. You can be seated this evening. Here in the book of Psalms, Psalm chapter number 51, if you're a Bible studier, you know and understand that it is a psalm that was written by none other than King David. Now, David, I know that we're all familiar uh, in that with King David. He's a very uh, popular character in the Word of God, whether you've been in church for uh, any amount of time or not. No doubt uh, you're all familiar with that of King David. David was a great man of God. The Bible uh, describes him as a man who is after God's own heart. Uh, could I say if there's ever uh, everything that all, we ought to strive for as a child of God, uh, that could be said about you and I, uh, it not all be strive that we, uh, you know, people say, well, what a good singer he was, or what a good singer she was, or, 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 or how that man could preach, or this, that, and another, but it ought to be the desire of you and I that they would say, there's somebody who loved God, who walked after God, fellowship with God, and had a heart uh, for God himself. Uh, the Bible says about David that he was a man that was after God's own heart. I'm afraid we're living in a day of men's chasing everything but the heart of God. Somebody ought to say amen right there. Amen, it's getting November time and uh, it's deer hunting season. We all like deer hunting. I ain't preaching against it. Uh, but I got a problem with a man uh, who's got more passion for a deer stand, amen, uh, than the word of God. Somebody ought to help me preach right there. I I'm telling you, uh, we ought to chase after the things of God, the heart of God, the mind of God. God, David uh, was a man after God's own heart. However, we also learn from the life of David is that we learn that David, just as any man does, uh, David battled with sin. He faced sin. He battled with sin. And we know, according to Psalm chapter number 51, uh, that David lost some of those battles as well. Uh, you know the story. David, he committed the terrible sin of adultery there uh, with the Seba and, and, uh, and all that transpired. Uh, there in that account and, and we see that it costed the man of God and, and it costed not just him but it costed others around him uh, in his life. Could I say uh, that when you choose to see it and live in sin and play with sin it won't just affect you uh, but it'll affect others around you as well. Amen. Uh, there's a lot of families tonight that uh, have, ever, have forever been chained uh, because of one man's individual choice uh, to sin and live in sin. Amen. Uh, David, he battled with sin and he chose to, uh, to commit sin. And, and by the way, that is what sin does. Sin never brings about joy in your life. Uh, sin never brings about happiness in your life. Uh, there is pleasure in sin, uh, but it is only for a season. Amen. It's just a short time and a short while. You'll never benefit uh, when you choose sin. Uh, you choose to sin and it'll cost you ever so single time. And we know that according uh, to the scriptures and if you've been in this thing for any amount of time, uh, we know by experience as well uh, that we know that sin hinders our walk with the Lord, uh, sin hinders our fellowship with God, and sin hinders our worship to God. Uh, when you fall in sin, when you step in sin, uh, when you play with sin, commit sin, live in sin, stay in sin, deny your sin, try to cover up your sin, uh, when you try to justify it, uh, hide your sin, fellowship with sin, it'll cost you every single time. And I want you to think with me tonight, if David, God's man, I mean this was God's man, this was a man who loved God, walked with God, if David, a man after God's own heart, if he battled with sin, he struggled with sin, 
You and I would be foolish tonight to believe that you and I won't struggle with sin as well. David, he battled with sin. May I remind you tonight, there is an enemy among us. He wants to lure you into a life of sin. Amen. He wants, to, he wants to lure you into a life of sin and he wants to lead you in that and to the hog lot. That's where he wants you. And that's where you'll end up should you choose sin. And the fact is you're going to find out that the longer you go in this thing, the more you're going to battle with sin, the more you're going to battle with the flesh. And there will be times that you do fall into sin. Amen. Uh, I'm not saying you ought to. I, I hope you don't, but we ought to strive for holiness. We ought to strive for righteousness tonight, but the truth of the matter is is that the more you battle with sin, the more apt you are to fall into sin. And I'm not making an excuse. I'm just being realistic with you tonight. I'm talking about from the moment you wake your head until the moment you lay it down at night, you're going to be in a battle. You'll be faced with a battle. There's been times in my life I've failed. And there's been times in my life that I've wronged God, I've sinned against God, I've made some bad decisions, I've some poor choices, I regret them, I don't like to think about them. And, and there's been times in your life as well uh, because of the battle that we are engaged in each and every single day. And by the way, before I know we are getting a sentence like this and everybody's got your shooting tie on, you got your I love Jesus smile on your face and everybody looks all holy and righteousness and everything out there, uh, but some of you, you know I'm telling it right, it ain't nothing but leaves as we talked about this morning. Uh, the Bible says it like this, if we say that we have no sin, you ain't nothing but a liar. And the truth ain't in you. Amen. Amen. You're living in the same world I'm living in. You're battling the same flesh I'm battling with. Uh, and you're facing the same battle with sin uh, that the next man is facing, uh, fa uh, uh, battling with each and every day. And the fact is, there's going to be times you're going to struggle. David found himself in a bad place in a bad way and as a result we see uh, Psalm chapter number 51 he, he, he pins this chapter he had chosen to see it he committed to see it as a result it brought heartache it brought a, a regret and sorrow in the man of God's life and it affected his walk with the Lord and I could deal tonight with how David ended up where he was ended up at, and I could deal with, you know, why he was there, and on and on and on and on. And, and, and by the way, young people, that's why we preach so hard against sin. Amen. I wouldn't give a plug nickel for a preacher that don't preach against sin. Amen. Sin's real, friend. You can get up, sugarcoat it, and I mean, I mean, I mean, dress it up all you want to, but sin's nasty. It still brings about distress and and death and regret. Amen. And, and, and hey, if you're a man of God, uh, you ought to stand up. You ought to rebuke sin. You ought to preach against sin. Amen. Uh, and young people, you ought to strive to hide yourself from sin, flee from every appearance of evil. And I could deal with how he ended up there, but that's not where my heart is tonight. What I'm most interested in is what do you do when you find yourself in the place? And what do you do when you find yourself struggling in the battle with sin? And falling into temptation of sin, what do you do? You know what I like about David, Brother Mason? This, it stuck out to me as I was in my study today and I was praying. Here's what I love about David. Although David made some terrible choices, and although David made a terrible decision and, and committed a terrible sin and he, and he found himself in a bad way and in a bad place, you know what I like about David? David also shows us the right response to when you find yourself in that condition. You see, it's one thing for you to sin and it's one thing for you to make a bad choice and a, and a bad decision and go the wrong way, but then it's a totally different other when you try to justify it and cover it up and act like it ain't no big deal. You know what you ought to do? You ought to show everybody else the right way to handle it when you get there. Amen, amen, amen. And if more people get a hold of that, uh, the altar would be a lot more used than what it is in the today, uh, in the church of today. Somebody ought to say amen. That's good preaching whether you like it or not. Amen. amen. David shows us the right response. You say, what is the right response? That is repentance. Biblical 
repentance, real repentance. David exemplifies the right response to when we sin in our lives, and that is real biblical repentance. And that's what I'm dealing with tonight. I'm going to give you a couple of points. We're going to go to the house. Number one, I want you to notice what we learn from Psalm chapter number 51 is number one, real repentance. Real repentance doesn't make excuses. Real repentance doesn't make excuses. Notice what your Bible says. You read down through here starting in verse number one and notice all of the personal pronouns that is made mention of. Here's what I mean. David says in verse number one, he says, have mercy upon who? Upon me. He says in verse number, uh, verse number one at the end of the verse, he says, brought out not their transgressions, but he says, brought out my transgressions. Personal pronoun, that's me, that's my, that's mine, that's, uh, that's I. He says in verse number two, wash me. Verse three, for I acknowledge my transgression, my sin is ever before me against thee and the only have I sinned, not they sinned, not my people, not my neighbor, but it was me, O oh Lord. Uh, verse number five, behold, I was shapen in iniquity. Real repentance never makes excuses. David does not make an excuse as to why he ended up in the shape that he was in. But David takes responsibility and owns up that he was where he was because of the choices that he made. Amen. I'm about fed up with this generation we're living in now today. That I mean, this excuse-filled generation we're living in. Everybody's got an excuse. It's always somebody else's fault. You don't believe me? I mean, it's always the teacher's fault. It's always the ball coach's fault. It's always the preacher's fault. And man, it's always this one's fault. It's always the parent's fault. And sometimes it is the parent's fault because you neglect to take your belt off and to give them a whooping when they need it. And man, and, uh, but at the end of the day, here's what I've come to learn. I've seen some come out of good situations and good homes and they turn out, I mean, living like hell. And then I've seen some come out of the worst situations how to be some of the finest servants of God how that's living in today's world how to understand this when it comes down to it it is an individual choice and if you're here today and there's sin in your life and you're not where you ought to be in your walk with God stop blaming the preacher stop blaming everybody else and own up to the fact you're where you're at because of the choices you made amen. amen, amen, and amen real repentance don't make excuses David never says in Psalm chapter number 51, David never says, well, God, I'm sorry, but now you know I'd have never, I'd have never got in the mess I was in had she not been where she was at. He never does that. He never says, God, she was in the wrong place. She wasn't in the wrong place. David was in the wrong place. David should have been on the battlefield. Amen. Amen. If he had been where he should have been, he would have never, it may have been, been in the battle that he was in. Faced with the, the decision and the temptation that he was in. I yawned a heat to that young person tonight. Amen. That's why your mom and daddy saw harping on you all the time about you better be careful who you run with. I y'all not be out. I had a, a wee hours of the night because just like Memo you said, ain't nothing go, good goes on after 10 o'clock at night unless you're coon hunting, all right? And so unless you're coon hunting, you ought to be at home in the bed by 10 o'clock because nothing good goes on after that. Amen. Uh, you ought to help there, Mom and Daddy. I'm trying to help you out. Uh, you better be careful of the situations you put yourself in uh, because if you're in a place where you ought not be, the temptation is just going to increase. Oh, yeah. And David could have used that as an excuse, but he didn't do that. David didn't say, well, you know, Lord, if she wouldn't have been there, then I wouldn't have done what I did. That's not real repentance. Real repentance never makes excuses. Look up in here. You did it. You chose it. You did it. It's not somebody else's fault. Nobody made you do it. Stop blaming everybody else for it. Own up to the fact that you chose to sin. You, you, you chose to do it. Real repentance doesn't make excuses. Number two, real repentance is produced 
from godly sorrow. Real repentance is produced from godly sorrow. The book of 2 Corinthians chapter number 2, verse number 7 says, This godly sorrow worketh repentance. I want you to get a hold of what I'm about to say to you tonight because if you're ever going to experience and practice real biblical repentance in your life, you need to understand that you will never truly repent until you first realize that you have sinned against God and you're sorry for it. Godly sorrow worketh repentance. Godly sorrow bring about real biblical repentance. If you're not bothered by the sin in your heart and the fact that you're breaking the heart of God when you choose to sin and live in sin, then you're never going to experience real repentance. David, in his repentance, he understood that he had sinned against God, that he had broke the heart of God, that he had, he had saddened God himself. Notice what he says in verse number four. He says, against thee, the only have I sinned. You know why a lot of people struggle with sin and they never truly repent? Because they're not that sorry for what they have just done unto God. I've been in this thing long enough now. I've seen it. I've seen, I've seen the church game get played over and over and over and over and over. They've been living in sin week after week after week after week and they ain't bothered by it the first time. But the first time somebody finds out about it, then all of a sudden they're on the altar crying. When I hold up, if you're sorry that I know about it, you still ain't repenting. It's not me that you need to be worried about. It's not your preacher you need to be concerned with. It's not your church that you need to be concerned with, although it ought to bother you. If you go out here and live a life that brings a black eye to the house of God and your own church, somebody ought to say amen right there. You ought not do anything to try to bring a black eye. You ought to help the cause of Christ and uplift the work of the gospel and the work of the ministry. But hey, if the only reason you're on the altar crying out for repentance is because somebody else found out you ain't, you ain't, it's wrong, friend. That ain't real. Real repentance is godly sorrow. You're sorry for what you've done to God. More importantly, sure, it affects others in your life, others around you, those in your life, your family. But more importantly, it ought to bother you by what you've done to the Lord. That's real repentance. Can I ask you tonight, does it not bother you that you don't fellowship with God like you used to or like you ought to be? Does that not bother you? Does it not bother you that you don't, you don't, you, you don't talk with the Lord like you used to? Does it not bother you that you don't shout like you used to shout? Does it not bother you that you can't worship like you used to worship? It broke David's heart that he broke the heart of God. And I'm going to tell you why I'm concerned today. I'm concerned with this lack of brokenness among the people of God today. Amen. I know we're living in a proud generation, but it seems like that, uh, this, uh, or this society we're living in has now affected the house of God. Now we've got a bunch of proud Christians. Amen. Walking in like, you know, the, the, you know, God owes you. God don't owe us anything. And there's a lack of, of sorrow and brokenness among the people of God. Real repentance is produced from godly sorrow. It ought to concern you. It ought to sorrow you and break your heart that you have broke the heart of God. That's real repentance. Lastly, I'll give you one more and I'll be done tonight. I want to say not only is real repentance, not only does it not make excuses, not only is it produced from godly sorrow, but may I say lastly tonight that real repentance brings about a change. Real repentance brings about a change. Notice what your Bible says, verse number seven. David, as he's crying out unto God, he says in verse number seven, he says, purge me with hyssop. 
I shall be clean. Wash me and I shall be whiter than so. Make me uh, to hear joy and gladness that the bones which thou hast broken may rejoice. Hide thy face from my sins and blot out all mine iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from thy presence and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation and uphold me with thy free spirit. David is crying out uh, and gives us the example of real biblical repentance here in Psalm chapter number 51 and he's crying out, he's not making excuses, he realizes that he's hurt God, he's, he's brought shame to the name of the Lord and, and, and it's affected his walk with God and, and that's what he's most concerned with but also David is aware of the fact that there is a change that needs to take place. Here's what I like too. David realizes that the only one that can bring that change is God himself. Amen. Notice how he says this. He says, purge me with his son. He says, make me to hear joy and gladness. He says, hide thy face from my sins. Blood. Create in me a clean heart, O God. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation. Now don't you think that if David wanted the joy of his salvation back and he could do it himself, don't you think he would have done it? Well, sure he did. But now he's crying out to God. Why? Because this is a work that only God can do. Real repentance is a change that takes place, but it is a work of God Almighty. David realizes that true joy, true happiness, and being truly satisfied is only found in the Lord himself. Oh, I like this aside. I love verse number 11. Notice what he says in verse number 11. He says, cast me not away from thy presence and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. In other words, here's what David says. David says, God, whatever you do, whatever you do, Lord, I don't want to be without you. God, you can kill me. You can do whatever you want to do. You can purge me. You can, I mean, whatever's necessary, but whatever you do, God, don't take thy presence essence away from me. God, I don't want to live without you. God, I don't want to be without you. I can do without a lot of things, Lord, but I can't do without you. Good God Almighty, I feel it while I tell it. Could I say tonight, there's a lot I can do without in this life. Amen. I love being in meet with y'all. I love our church. I love a church family. I love all that God's doing. But hear me now, I, I, and the reality is I can live without you and you can live it without, you can make it without me. But ain't neither one of us in here tonight. How could we ever make it without the good grace and the good presence of the Lord? Amen, amen, amen. I tell you what, I don't want to go to church without his presence. I don't want to live life without his presence. I don't want to wake up tomorrow and have to go to the Word without his presence. I want God in the midst. I want to be where God is. Amen. David says, I can do without a lot of things. I can't do without you, Lord. Real repentance desires the presence of God. And realizes that it is the sin that has hindered our walk with him and our fellowship with him. You know how you can tell when a person never truly repents? It's when there is no change that ever takes place. I could give you testimony after testimony, and I know these other men of God in here tonight could do it as well. I've seen many of them walk an aisle. You give an invitation and here they come and I'm talking about, I mean, shedding tears and, and it looks real good and you think, boy, they, they getting in on this thing tonight. They getting it right. And I mean, I get all fired up and happy for them. And then they don't even show back up to church on Sunday night. Matter of fact, they don't even come back next week. And they get up, they walk back out and they go right back to the same thing. You know what that is? That's not real repentance. That's not real repentance. Real repentance is not God, I'm sorry, but then you go right back to it. That's not real repentance. Now, I'm not saying you're not ever going to battle with it again. I'm not saying you're ever gonna, not ever going to fall into that temptation again, but I am saying I, there's going to be a change take place. There's going to be a, a difference. That, that's real repentance. Real repentance brings change. 
Now, here's why I'm preaching what I'm preaching tonight, and I'm done right here, but here's why I'm preaching it. I still believe in repentance. I do. As old-timey, old-fashioned as that sounds, I still believe in repentance. I still believe repentance is needful. Amen. I still believe in repentance, and I still believe that it's necessary to have a right relationship with God. But I also believe that we are in a time where there is a great famine of real biblical repentance. You know what brings about revival? Repentance. Everybody says, oh, preacher, I'd love to see, I'd love to see revival. I'd love to see the house filled. I mean, I'd love to see people coming and getting right with God. And I'd love to see a move of God. No, 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 no. I mean, we give those old testimonies. I'd like to see it way back yonder like it used to be. And, and I would too. But you study about the revivals of the past. You know what they all got in common? Every revival, wherever it was, whatever time period, uh, all of it, you study, they all got one thing in common. You know what it was? There was people on the altar crying with godly sorrow and remorse in their heart that they had sinned against God and that their fellowship with God wasn't like it ought to be and it broke their heart. And it wasn't seeing the church field that was their number one desire. You know what their desire was? They just want to be close to the Lord. They just, they just didn't want the presence of God to be taken away from them. They just wanted to, to more of it and more of it and more of it. And they, and they cried for it. That's real repentance. You don't see that anymore. It's like we don't care about it anymore. We've learned to go to church. We've learned to sing the songs, preach the messages. We've learned to go through the ritual and the traditions and the, you know, go through the motions. And very rarely do you see people open before God, filled with godly sorrow, crying to God out of remorse in real repentance. No wonder we're in the shape we're in. No wonder the presence of God is not like it used to be in a lot of our lives and in our churches. And so I ask you tonight, what is it that's in your life right now that's causing problems with your walk with the Lord? What is it that's in your life right now that's hindering your fellowship with God? What is it that's affecting your worship to where you can't shout like you used to shout? And you can't enjoy it like you used to enjoy it. And then here's my question tonight. What are you going to do about it? It's one thing to get there. It's another thing when you try to cover it up and live life like ain't nothing wrong. Won't you just go ahead and be like David and own up to the fact you did it, you chose it, you made a mistake, but you're going to get it right because there's one thing you're not going to forfeit. You don't want to forfeit the presence of God in your life. Whatever you do, Whatever you do, God, I don't want to live life without you. God, I've got to have you. And when a person gets to that point, that's when you'll see real repentance on display. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the word of God tonight. Lord, I thank you for the truths of thy word. The reality tonight that real repentance is available and possible if we, thy people, will just follow the example that's been set before us. I pray there'd be a desire in the hearts of so many people tonight that get so consumed with thy presence there would be a brokenness and a sorrow and it would produce a real repentance I pray if there's one here tonight that does not know you, Lord, I, I pray you speak to them in a special way. And I pray tonight be the night they turn from their sin, repent of their sin, place their faith in you and be forever changed. I pray nobody leaves not knowing where they're going to spend eternity, not ready to 
draw their last breath and step off into eternity. But I pray that all, may we all leave changed by the power of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. We love you tonight. We bless your name. It's in Jesus' high and holy name we do humbly pray.